On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, we're going to dive into Derek Lively. Is he an option at pick 12 for Oklahoma City? What does he bring to the table, and can he fit next to Chet Holmgren? All this coming up on today's Locked On Thunder podcast. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com, Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Email the show, LOThunderPod at gmail.com. On today's show, we're diving into another NBA draft profile and projection. This time, we're diving into Duke forward slash center Derek Lively. Is he the right fit for Oklahoma City at pick 12? Can he fit next to Chet Holmgren? And is he actually a traditional big man that Thunder fans crave? Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. This is our draft dash. You're going to get a profile podcast from this point forward through the draft. uh, So you never miss an episode. So you can always get caught up on who the draft prospects are at pick 12. We're going to do some picks in the second round at 37, 50, all that good stuff. So stay tuned right here. Locked on Thunder. You everydayers can expect uh, a Monday show to be about uh, Balai Kulabai. And we're going to talk about Ryan Repair on Tuesday. And then we're going to talk with Thunder Chats from Twitter and uh, his podcast about just the draft in general from a fan perspective. So a lot to get into today uh, over there. Uh, Coming to us from the Topic Thunder podcast, Thunder Chats will be on the pod this week. Uh, And then we'll also, of course, have more profiles. So, you know, we're going to do Derek Lively today, Balai Kulabale on Monday, Ron Repair on Tuesday. Who do you want to hear about moving forward? Drop it down below in the comments. So today, Derek Lively, 7'1", 230, 7'7", wingspan, 19 years old out of Duke University, He's a mystery box to me because it's just the huge swing is going to be that shooting. Like, is that shooting real? And that's what makes him a mystery. He showed you the shooting in high school, showed you the shooting at the pro day, but he's not shown it against legit competition, which is worrisome. Let's get into what he's actually good at. He is a great pick and roll partner. He finishes at the rim at a high clip at an elite level off those rolls, short rolls, you know, cutting, You can use him in the dunker spot. Like he's a high level finisher at the rim uh, and and does those things from pick and roll action from cuts, uh, throwing him in the dunker spot as a, as a guy who can, you know, you can dish off to uh, on those SGA drives. And so he does some things really well. And part of him being a good cutter, good finisher is his hands. Like he is a guy that hardly ever bobbles away possessions. And on top of that, his hands are so good that he can make bad passes look good. He can still finish through bad passes. And that's a skill. That's like a receiver. It's a skill in the NBA as well. He's a lob threat that has a great leaping ability, a great athletic ability about him. And I think he also is a playmaker. Now, he's not a playmaker in the sense of like you put him at the at the elbow and run your offense through him, but he's really good at spray outs. He, he understands decision making. He understands where to get the ball to. Uh, off of rebounds, off of dumps, and you can you can play inside out with him, where he is just lightning fast, getting the ball out, with also you know decision making fast, seeing who's open, but the velocity on the ball allows it to where let's say you throw the ball into him in a low block, and he doesn't have anywhere to go, and so he can just whip it to the corner for a wide open shooter, and he throws the ball so fast that the defense cannot react to it. You get the open shot, and it turns into a, a great play. That's awesome that he has that skill set. That's awesome that he can do that. Perhaps his best trait, um, uh, along with the pick and roll stuff, would be in transition. He fills lanes and he maximizes the opportunity to score in transition. The Thunder, of course, play at a high pace, third in the league in pace, that they're going to want to go in transition. Uh, they've always wanted to play in transition, and so that's great. And then the defense. High-level help side defender, really good rim protector. Like He is a really, really good rim protector, 
I, I think that he didn't show it enough in high school and college, but I think that he showed that the tools are there to where he can eventually get to a spot where he's not played off the floor and where he can be a more versatile defender. I don't think that he's ever going to guard on the perimeter at all, but he's going to, I think he's going to get to a point where you can teach him and mold him to where he can not be exploited as much in the pick and roll, but that's going to be a, a bit of a concern for him moving forward. But just strictly as a rim defender, uh, and, you know, and a rim protector and as a help side defender, he does that really well. So hopefully he can get to that point where he's able to navigate defending the pick and roll as well as he's able to run the pick and roll. But if you draft Derek Lively, you're going to get some highlight blocks. You're going to get a great pick and roll partner on your roster. But that's about it. Like you can, you can hope that that shooting comes around to where it was in high school and where it was at his pro day. But I think that there's a reason why it didn't in college. And maybe you want to gamble on that. Maybe you want to gamble that, you know, here's a guy who can absolutely, you know, shoot the ball for whatever reason, whether you whether you want to blame coaching, whether you want to blame the the scheme, the system, whatever at Duke, for whatever reason he didn't show it in college, but then he showed it right back again in the off season. Sure. Maybe you want to gamble on that. But to me, there's just not much more there to his game. He he can't dribble. He's almost scared to put the ball on the floor. That takes you know any sort of creativity away from his offense. He's not an elite rebounder, in my opinion. Like I I think that if you are if you're looking at him and you're going you know look he's seven one, and he's two thirty. This is the tradition. This is the traditional big that the Thunder have always needed, and, 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 and they need it on this roster after that Minnesota game. He's a fine rebounder. He's not an elite rebounder. He doesn't just gobble up rebounds and and in possessions on the defensive end at all. So that's going to be tough. He has defensive lapses that I do think can be coached out of him because he is athletic enough to have, you know, to have that fixed. He does not have this elite motor about him. It was better at Duke, but still, it's not an elite level motor to where that's worrisome for a big. And at times he shies away to me. Like at times he's a big that you watch him and he's going up against these guys that have, you know, way less talent than him, even at times way less size than him. And he's just not taking advantage of that moment. Was that a college thing? Was he instructed to, you know, not be selfish? What We don't know what was coached and taught to him at Duke, but that was a bit worrisome. There were times where he just was not able to take advantage of mismatches. The defensive lapses were tough. The fact that there's any questions about motor for a big man is always worrisome, but I do think that those are were way, were way more kind of highlighted about his high school you know, coming into college than it is now, but still something to monitor. And then he just, he just can't dribble. He can't, he can't put the ball on the floor. He cannot get himself, I think, out of adverse situations when you give him the ball uh, and he gets, you know, say doubled, you know, if they throw a double out of him after you pass him the ball, it's just going to be tough in that sense, besides his passing that can make up for that a little bit. But if you want to draft a great pick and roll partner who can block shots, Derek Lively is your guy. And then you, and then on top of for sure getting that, you do have the chance that he becomes a shooter and he feels comfortable shooting the ball in games. But at the end of the day, Derek Lively produced five points per game, five rebounds per game, and assists per game, and two blocks per game at Duke while shooting, you know, 60, 15, and, and, and what was it, 60 from the line as well. So, like, you, you look at him and he goes 65% from the field, 15% from three, and 60% at the free throw line. For a guy who could shoot in high school and then can shoot at pro day to only shoot 60% at the at the um, free throw line is not encouraging because typically you want that marker to be at 70 or above to show shooting touch. On layups, instead of dunks, he only made 52% of his layups. So 52% of his layups is what he made. That's not all that encouraging. So I, I, I struggle to, to fully embrace that pro day performance. But he does have skills that I think you do not have to worry about them translating. And why is that important? We'll talk about that coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at FanDuel, folks. FanDuel is awesome. It is NBA Finals Day yet again. So you're going to want to go over and check out FanDuel because Game 2 of the NBA Finals is happening tonight. Uh, right now, customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. So if you're a new customer 
Go right now if you're a new customer to fanduel.com slash locked on, fanduel.com slash locked on. And when you do, and you're a new customer, you get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That is $2,500 back if your first bet does not win in bonus bets. So it's a great deal. Go check it out today because FanDuel is the official partner of Locked On and the official sports betting partner of the NBA as well. FanDuel.com, go there and you can bet on tonight's NBA Finals game. The Heat are eight-point underdogs in Denver. Is he going to, are the Heat going to even the series and steal one on the road? We'll see what they do, but that's the odds right now at FanDuel.com. Go there right now, FanDuel.com slash Lockdown. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I love what Derek Lively does in the pick and roll. I think that that was something that Duke did not take advantage of enough in, you know, throughout his college career. I love his ability to finish at the rim. Like he is one of the best rim finishers in this draft class. I can envision him being used on those short rolls, those pick and rolls, those cuts. I think that he can be a better cutter um, at the NBA level than he was at the college level even. And you can't think away just for a guy who doesn't like the dribble to put him in the dunker spot and let him go and you know, hammer it home on a dump off. It would be great too. And his hands are great. So like I highlight that a second time because for a guy who doesn't like the dribble and a guy who um, is only going to be able to score when you spoon feed him the ball and, and put him in, in, in advantageous situations, he's got to be able to capitalize on it. We talked about this with Leonard Miller. With Leonard Miller. If you're if that's going to be your role as this kind of rim running big, you've got to be able to catch the ball every single time. And Derek Lively, to his credit, has great hands. With that comes a lob threat, which is always going to be fun. He gives you a, a new look. If you're talking about the, the Thunder perspective at 7-1 and a beefy 7-1. But I personally don't buy the shot. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope that no matter who he goes to, you know, for his sake, he becomes a really good shooter and, and that pro day was real. But I just cannot buy that shot at pick 12. I don't think that you gamble on that at pick 12. And I think that he runs the, the floor really well in transition. That's great. But the negatives to me, not a great motor, like not an elite level motor, uh, defensive lapses at times, but to his credit, I think that he can fix that. It's it's not as though the defensive lapses are so bad that I think he's unplayable in, in, in a postseason environment. I think that he could eventually get there where he is um, a, a, a the impactful player in the postseason. The fact that he cannot dribble and can, and can put himself in bad spots because of it. The fact that he's not a just dominant otherworldly rebounder uh, is, is concerning to me for a guy that you're going to draft and hope that, that he can be there. And then here's the biggest point too. It takes big men a long time to adjust to the NBA. Like I look at guys like Anyaka and Kungu, like who had immensely more talent. Like, like had a way more talent than Derek Lively did in college. Looked a lot better as a prospect in college. And he's just now from that 2020 class, just now, getting to the point where he is able to get starting level opportunities for the Atlanta Hawks. Nick Claxton, you know, year four was whenever he, whenever he burst onto the scene, really like these things take time. These things are, these things are going to, to have to develop for a big men, especially. So that's what it looks like for traditional bigs. Like there's been like guys like Evan Mobley. Evan Mobley is, you know, playing the four next to Jared Allen. Like that helps him a lot. And he was just special and was way better than, than Derek Lively was. Like for people of Derek Lively's evaluation, it takes time. Even for guys like Anyakon Kongwu, who's, who I think was better than Lively as a prospect. The Thunder also view Chet Holmgren as a center. Like I, I, I know that the national landscape of like the media doesn't really, hasn't really caught on to that yet. Uh, I know that some fans look at Chet and say, how can he be a center? The Thunder view Chet Holmgren as a center. And yes, he's going to struggle to, to stop Jokic. Everyone does. But besides that, he can hold his own against any other center. You know, and Embiid is great. Embiid will, will be able to get his reports of last summer that Chet Holmgren was playing against Embiid last summer and was, was holding his own against Embiid. And we've seen Embiid be a player who at times can kind of shy away or the lights get too bright, whatever you want to put on Embiid. We've seen that happen in the postseason. And furthermore, you're not going to play Embiid in the postseason to get to the finals. And I'll take, I'll take that bet once the Thunder get to the finals. For Jokic, a guy in, in your conference, like 
we've we, we've we've seen that nobody can stop Jokic. AD couldn't. Bam couldn't so far. He's going to find a way to impact the game, no matter who you throw at him. So it doesn't matter. Past that, there's no other center who just consistently dominates the game. AD doesn't consistently dominate the game offensively. He, we saw this postseason. Every game, there was a post of like, oh, game one, 50 points. Game two, two points. Like, obviously not that dramatic, but still. The ebbs and flows of AD's postseason, you know, series this year was evident. So the Thunder View Chalmers is center. He's going to play center. They're not going to, I don't think, abandon that anytime soon, especially not this year. And I don't think that Lively can play the four. So when you look at them, there's just too many X's against Lively for the Thunder specifically for me to be enthralled with the idea of picking him at 12. Now, if Lively slips down the board and you want to buy back in and get Lively with a second first round pick, that is more appetizing because he does provide you that change of pace. But I think at pick 12, the ceiling is just not there. And on top of that, on top of not having the ceiling, we've seen rookie big men don't make that immediate impact that you're hoping for anyway. Like it takes big men a long time to, to adjust to the NBA. And that's no knock. It takes even, even some of the best big men to adjust. But, but I, I wouldn't say that he's better than, than guys like Anyaka and Kangwu who took a little while to, to get substantial playing time for the Hawks to where that would probably be the path that he mirrors with Oklahoma city. And as a rookie in general, no matter where he's at. So I like lively in general, but I think 12 is too rich for Derek Lively. I feel way comfortable even trading back to get Lively or or, or or trading back into the first round to get Lively. But at 12, it just does not it just does not hit me right at pick 12 for Derek Lively. I think that that Lively is a case of fans recency biased. You just saw the Timberwolves crush the Thunder. And you think, how can we match up with with, with, with Rudy Gobert and Cat, and we're just going to get dominated on the glass and this and that? It's going to be all right. You don't got to spin pick 12 on a 7 1 guy just because you got out rebounded by Minnesota in the last game of the season. This is the first step of team building for a team that is still yet not 500 and is still going to look for ways to improve. Synergy numbers, though, there are some great things about his synergy numbers. Let's start with overall offense, 96 percentile. Half-court offense, 96 percentile as well. 93rd percentile in transition. 70th percentile in out-of-timeout plays. 95th percentile against man defense. 97th percentile is a pick-and-roll roller. 60th percentile on cuts. 55th percentile on offensive putbacks. 15% on catch-and-shoot jumpers. 15% on all jump shots that he took. 77% at the rim, 90th percentile. That's great. That's great. The problem at the rim was 52% on layups. Only missed two dunks all year. Was one for eight on tip-ins. Defensively, uh, you know, he's 49th percentile in man, as, man, as a man defender. Didn't uh, get a ton of ISO attempts, only 11, but he did rank in the 82nd percentile on the 11 ISO attempts. Uh, he was in the 51st percentile as a pick-and-roll um, pick defender. He was in the 52nd percentile in overall, off, uh, overall defense. And when he defends the rim, though, this is where he, he stood tall. Matchups only scored 39% at the rim against Derek Lively. So that ranks him in the 83rd percentile. Some encouraging numbers for him uh, on the synergy front. Where is he available in these mock drafts? So the ringer has him at 19, ESPN at 14, Athletic at 14, Bleacher Report at 21, CBS at 22, NBC at 20, DraftNet at 19, Tankathon at 19, I have him at 26. Mavs draft has him at 30. So anywhere from 30 all the way up until 14. I just, I don't see him being the best option at pick 12. I think that the ceiling for Derek Lively would be that that three-point shot comes to a average level or maybe a slightly above average level, making him a really good modern starting big man. Here's the kicker though. And, and, and here's why I think that Lively gets some credit. I think that his floor is a serviceable rotational big man. Like if everything went wrong for Derek Lively and it just nothing worked out, I think he'd still be 
a serviceable big man in the rotation, which we've seen, you know, we, we've seen where sometimes you go for the boomer bust guy and they bust. And not only do they bust, they're not in the league anymore. So I think that Derek Lively will at least be a rotational big in the NBA. And again, it's going to take time, just like it takes time for other big men. But I don't see a way where he just flames out and just isn't in the league and just terrible. So that's great. You know, that's actually really encouraging because in every draft class, there's going to be X amount of players who just aren't even in the league in three years and just are not good at all. And I do not think that that's Lively's future. I just think that it's a tough sell, not for the league, but for the Thunder. The way the Thunder want to play, the way the Thunder are building their roster, where the Thunder are picking at at pick 12. Again, if the Thunder had pick 12 plus pick 22 or pick 12 plus pick 16, it'd be a different story. It'd be a whole different conversation about Derek Lively. But at pick 12, it's just tough to draft a guy who might become a good modern starting big man. Might. His ceiling is that to me. If that's your ceiling, it's not exactly a, a great option at 12, in my opinion. Uh, one of the comps I've seen uh, uh, for from Kevin O'Connor for him was Willie Cully Stein. Seems about right. But do you want Willie Cully Stein at 12? We'll see. We'll see. Coming up, we'll talk about his fit with the Thunder and, and, and how he might coexist with Chet Holmgren if they were to take him. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast. On the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. Folks, for your next listen, check out the Lockdown NBA Big Board Podcast. It's a great draft show about the NBA draft. Uh, you every day are just going to expect uh, Balai Kulabale tomorrow, draft profile, Ryan Repair Tuesday. And we're going to talk with Thunder Chats as well this week. So what profile do you want to hear from next? You've got Lively today. You've got Kulabale tomorrow. You've got Repair Tuesday, what do you want to hear about uh, throughout the week? Uh, and we, again, this is part of our draft dash. We're going to be here for you Saturday and Sunday as well. So drop those uh, prospect profiles below. To me, his role is a, is a bench big. Derek Lively would be in Oklahoma City. He's a bench big that depending on matchups, you might want to throw looks at him where maybe he does start here and there. Maybe he plays starting little minutes in certain games. But in general, he's a bench big. The roster impact would be that Jeremiah Robinson Earl would be gone. I think that I think that Jay Will would be, would win that battle between him and JRE. Obviously, the twelfth overall pick would win the battle over JRE, and so sadly, JRE would not be kind of in the fold for much longer in Oklahoma City. Why the Thunder should take him? If the Thunder, if the Thunder believe in that shot, and they believe that that three point shot is real, and then it adds a wrinkle to his game and kind of changes the dimension of what Derek Lively can play in, then that'd be great. And he would provide an insurance policy just in case that Chet Holmgren is in the center. Then you can react and already have kind of your, your safety valve on your roster. You'd start out with Chet at, at the five, Jid at the four, uh, you know, Dort, Giddy, SGA. But then, you know, it, it, two years from now, if the center experience does not work out for Chet, you can have Lively there. Uh, that'd be fine. But that's kind of it for the reasons why you should take him. The reasons why you shouldn't take him is you firmly believe that Chet Holmgren's a center. Lively does not dominate the glass. His shot has not appeared against real competition before. And there's far better, better value at pick 12. Uh, and, and for all the outcry that there was about the Thunder needing a high-impact player, uh, rookie big men typically are not high-impact players. You know, especially rookie traditional big men. Especially rookie traditional big men who are not picked in the top five. So uh, it's a bit concerning. There's just too many reasons not to take them, in my opinion. I will say this, though. For, for myself and everyone who looks at the recent draft patterns of, of Sam Presti, that's only natural to look at the, at the recent picks to piece together what has been said from Sam and, and others and, and predict who he's going to take. At some point, the archetype will shift. I don't think it's going to shift yet, but at some point it will shift. So... Derek Lively, to me, does not fit the archetype that we've presently seen. But eventually, the archetype will shift. And, and that could be in three weeks. That could be in three years. That could be in 30 years. Who knows? But eventually, the archetype will shift. So keep that in mind as well. But I know Lively has some fans in the Thunder fan base. And, and, and I think that he's another guy where he does so many things well that if the Thunder did draft him, you would hop on Synergy, you'd hop on YouTube, you'd hop on all these places, and you'd eventually get really excited and start envisioning what he can bring. 
But for my taste right now, I just think there's better options available at 12. But I've been wrong before. I thought Josh Jackson would be great. Uh, Sam Price has been wrong before. Everyone's been wrong before. So we'll see. So I, I hope that for Lively's sake, he can become a really good shooter like he was in his pro day. Like if that pro day shooting is real, um, that changes the evaluation a little bit. But that's where I'm at right now on Derek Lively. Let me know what you think of Derek Lively down below. Let me know who you want to hear about on this draft profile series as we dash our way to the NBA draft in the comments on YouTube and on Twitter at Ryland underscore styles. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.